Okay, welcome back. See, here we are again. It's another beautiful day. The sun. Um, so, we're going to continue our journey through the animal kingdom. And so, this is the second lecture on protostomes. Last lecture, we talked about the flatworms, Platyhelminthes. So, the free living flatworms like Planaria and Clasturbularia and flukes, as well as tapeworms. Hmm. So now we are going to move, those are the platozoans, all right? And let me just point out, we're only going through the highlights of the protostomes. No shade to everybody else, um, but we're highlighting just a few groups, mainly the ones you're going to be seeing in lab. So you may say, well, we didn't go through all the platozoans. No, we didn't. Your book does talk about rotifers, and I encourage you, you, you should be reading your book. I encourage you to consult that. Um, and the rotifers are very interesting, the little, little animals. Um, it, talk, it talks more about that, I think, than I, than I covered myself um, in the last lecture, because we mainly did the worms. But uh, just be aware. And, you know, just we, we've gone through each of these, at least briefly, because I wanted you to see them and I wanted us to talk about them so you saw the vast diversity, but we are going to try to stay pretty focused here. So, last time flatworms. Now we are moving, we're still in the protostomes and the spiralia, so now we're going to talk about Lophotrochozoans. And remember, um, these animals have a free swimming trochophore larva, and you have a lophophore feeding, um, feeding apparatus um, that is in the larval stage. Okay, so those are the lophotrochozoans, and today we're going to focus on the mollusks. So get ready. You probably know mollusks and love them. They're very successful. All right, so here are just a few examples of some mollusks. They have a very wide array of, of habitats. I mean, okay, most are marine. Yeah, most are marine, freshwater, some freshwater, and then you have, you know, terrestrial gastropods and snails. Um, but that's a pretty, that's a good, good coverage, right? So also a number of feeding modalities. So filter feeders up to carnivores. Um, so here's an example. You have the flame scallop, uh, an octopus. So this is really cool. The octopus is showing you here the beak. They have a sharp, deadly beak. Okay, the Nautilus. These are incredibly old animals. Um, the banana slug. If you're into sports, you may be familiar with the University of California Santa Cruz banana slugs. I know that because of Quiz Bowl. Quiz. I don't know why. I, I don't even. I mean, good, good. If you like sports, but Quiz Bowl. Are you doing it again? Gonna be washed out. Okay, I'll do it. Actually, it kind of smooths out the wrinkles, eh? No. Daddy's <laughs> here. Hey again. Got his eyes. They are incredibly googly. Okay, perfect. Back to ballas. So, yes. Oh, yes. Okay, so banana slugs. So some nice gastropod. All right, so let's go go over some general features. Um, most most mollusks have a shell, but not all, and and some of them the shell is actually has been internalized. Okay, here you have um, very clear cephalization in in many of these animals, um, and that is really helpful, right? We've talked about that before. Have having concentrated nerve tissue at one end of the body really assists the animal and things like, um, you know, a clear locomotion direction, right? But also in finding food um, and is protective too, because typically there's some sort of protective, either a shell or, you know, bone structure around the nervous tissue that allows that very important tissue to be um, protected from the environment. 
right? Mollusks have an open circulatory system. And we're, we're going to get into this a little bit more each in turn. I'm just giving you an overview, okay? They have a mantle. So uh, they have a mantle that covers their visceral mass. So mollusk bodies are typically divided into a head region, a foot region, and a visceral mass. And I do that on myself. It's not like that in mollusks. I should not do that. So, so the... I give up. All right. So... The mantle covers the visceral mass, mass, um, and the mantle, that is where the shell um, will develop from, okay? And then you have that trochophore larva, which we've talked about before. They are lophotrochozoans, okay? And this is showing you just the inside of a bivalve. So here you have the mantle over the visceral mass, which is all this stuff here, okay? And from that mantle, the shell grows out of the mantle, all right? So here is your trochophore larva. It is the first larval stage in, um, and the main larval stage in some of the mollusks. Some mollusks have a second larval stage. So this is a free-swimming free swimming, free swimming larva that utilizes the cilia here to, to swim. And this is the main way that a lot of mollusks will... Uh, Disperse. You know, there, there are quite a few mollusks that are sessile, particularly the bivalves, right? Those are your clams and mussels. So they can move. They can move with their muscular foot. But this is a really helpful life history strategy because it allows for wide dispersal because you have this free swimming larval stage. Let me say that again. So this is a really useful life history strategy because it allows for wide dispersal since it's a free swimming larval stage. Okay. We're just gonna go around the house. That's right. I could teach. I could teach. We could walk. We could bicycle. I'm not gonna bicycle, guys. We could, yeah. Except then I wouldn't have my slides. So, okay. So, mollusks range pretty well in size. We'll just go over here. I try not to teach on the couch because I'm trying to, you know, keep things real profesh. Um, but, you know, I can teach you in a box. I can teach you with a fox. I can teach you here or there. Anyway. All right, so mollusks, large range of sizes here, okay? They can be itty bitty. Many of you have probably seen really small snails before, right? They get incredibly small, like to the millimeter level, and up to and including humongous clams. You may have heard of giant squid. So they get huge. So there's a very large range of sizes in this phylum. There, Ziggy. Yes, so many sizes. Okay. So, these animals, like most, uh, evolved in the oceans, and they haven't really strayed very far from there. Most most mollusks are marine, but like I said before, um, and you'll hear me say over and over to help you remember, you have freshwater mollusks, and you have some terrestrial mollusks, all right? And these are really important animals for us. They're very important animals in their ecosystems because they occupy a range of niches or have a range of jobs, eating different things, you know, um, herbivores um, and carnivores, filter feeders. But they're also important to humans, uh, particularly as a source of food. So seafood is really important, especially in particular to um to societies that grew up, grew up, that developed and are located, you know, on coasts or on islands, right? So, and you tend to see more seafood-rich diets, at least historically, in places like that. Though, I mean, I'm sure all of you are like, what are you talking about? I love seafood. Um, and I live in a landlocked state. State. Y'all, I can't say words today. Um, yeah, that's true. But... That's just historically. But they're an important source of food for us. So you can think about all the mollusks in your life. If you are someone who in, who um, engages in uh, eating seafood, maybe you have eaten some mollusks, right? 
Have you, maybe you've eaten oysters? Maybe you've eaten escargot, snail, right? Um, you know, there have, I have enjoyed a, a squid in my life. It was all right at Tokyo House in Little Rock. That was not an ad, but I do endorse them because they're they're they were young. They're probably not open right now. They're not. Okay. Anyway, so important for food. All right. Um, and we so food and for pretties. <laughs> um, pretties, as my nanny would call them. So we, you know, mother of pearl. Um, and pearls themselves. So you have, I don't have ever pictures here. No. So mother of pearl is, is found in abalone shells. It's the inside there of the abalone shell. And fun fact in, so there used to um, be, you know, taken, well, always from, um, from abalone shells. And so you could actually go out, um, I think it, somebody told me before you could go out to the White River and every now and then, you know, you could find a mussel. I, I don't think that that's true. I think that that's an old wives' tale. But um, folks used to go out and they would punch, they'd grab, gather these shells and then they'd punch holes to make buttons. Okay. I'm not sure if, if modern mother of pearl uh, buttons and things like that, I think that they're synthetic now. Um, I should look that up, though, and I'll let you know. Ask me on Thursday. Friday. Friday. Yes. Okay. So that's, so mother of pearl. And maybe you've seen it. I have had um, clothes with fake mother of pearl buttons, uh, but it's, it's very um, popular. And we use these things to decorate our homes. Like if maybe you've seen, I've seen shells, uh, soap dishes, you know, cause they're nice and decorative. Um, you see it in jewelry and also pearls. Pearls are a very popular jewelry item. Um, which are basically produced, and I'll talk more about this in a minute. But they're produced when, when a shell, when a when a bivalve gets irritated. I mean, like physically irritated. So they're very important. Okay, they're also considered. Many mollusks are pests to humans. Um, Dracinia, uh, sorry, just just zebra mussels. Um, they are pretty um, catastrophic, devastating, and invasive, um, invasive species. So the zebra mussel is a bivalve that has invaded most of the Mississippi River Basin and the Arkansas River Basin. And you can find it, it will muck up boats, um, you know, boats and ships. It excludes native species. We have lots of, of bivalve species in Arkansas and in the Mississippi River Basin and other places as well that are um, threatened or endangered mainly because of the invasion of the zebra mussel. Okay, so pretty bad. Here, oh, here you see. So this is, these are places where you have um, invasion of the zebra mussel. And actually, if you were to look, interestingly, just a fun fact, if you were to look at the list of species in Arkansas that are endangered species, you know, there are certain like dar darter species, which is a kind of fish. Um, but most of our seriously endangered species are mussel species. And they're very important because they, they're filter feeders and they're food for other organisms. So um, they're actually it's really not a great thing to lose these species. And the zebra mussel pressure is, in, is compounding that issue, you know, humans cause that issue, but also zebra mussels. And we have also, humans facilitate the invasion of zebra mussels because the zebra mussels get into our boats and the boats move through various, you know, through various waterways. So, we also have the, the slug, garden slug. You know about them if you garden. Those mean all those silly slugs, those silly snails. They're just eating up your garden, right? So, so you're familiar, probably really familiar with mollusks. Um, and we're going to go through each of the big groups of mollusks. So so be prepared. Strap in. Um, let's see. Yeah. So And you can think about what your favorite mollusk is. 
Oh, man, that's so hard. Wow, because, you know, like, cephalopods are really smart. Gastropods, which are the snails, they're like the cows of the streams that I study. They eat with their radulas. They go... It's not exactly like that, actually. It's, it's a really cool process. Dr. Jones has a really beautiful video of um, an, an animal... I think uh, it's Gary, the snail in the marine tank, using his radula. I think, well, she also has an urchin. Well, anyway, I'm going to try to find you a video of um, the snail and its radula. I'm sure you could YouTube that. You could look it up. I'm sure there are snail videos. I'll link one. Yeah, okay. So, don't want to get too far off topic here because we want to stay on task. All right? Don't want to waste your time. All right. So, and I want to get through... The introduction so next time we'll just talk about the animals all right and you're like well you're talking about animals right now i mean each group all right so mollusks have varied body plans and they're all pretty interesting if i do say so myself so uh, your book and let me see i have oh, i have the book right here on um, page 668 you see um the various body plans of the mollusks all right, so notice, and so there are similarities and differences among even the mollusks. So you have the shell that grows from the mantle. Okay, okay, it's true over here as well. Okay, this is a gastropod. I'm going to show you two more here in just a sec. Um, and those mollusks that are marine or freshwater will have gills, of course, right? Um, whereas if you, um, if the animal is terrestrial, then you have a lung. Um, a lunged organism, though there are lunged snails that live in water, right? And they have pretty much, they have developed organ systems. Some people don't realize that, you know, a bivalve is a fully formed animal. It's, its own, it has an open circulatory system, but it's got organ systems. It has differentiated tissues, right? Um, so here in the bivalves and the cephalopods, so the bivalves, so here you have the, on the underside is the mantle and the shell growing out of it. Maybe I should go through each one just a bit. So notice, so here's a chitin. It's radula. It's tum-tum. All right. It's, it's simple, but um, complete and differentiated tissue systems. Okay. Radula also found in the snail. And here you have the muscular foot. You have a muscular foot here. So these are the hallmarks of the mollusks, the muscular foot, the radula, the shell, okay? Here, here's the muscular foot and the bivalve. If you've ever seen a live muscle, which are all over the place in Arkansas, I encourage you, um, you know, you can go out and if you find one, oh, don't, don't be around people, but if you find one, if you just put it in water and wait, Oftentimes they'll move. They'll stick their foot out, and that's actually how they, they move. Some people don't realize they are primarily sessile, but they can move with this muscular foot. It looks like they're sticking their tongue out like this. And they do it really slowly, usually. So you have to sit there and watch. All right. So, and usually I, I usually bring muscles to the lab. Um, maybe I should go get some muscles. Anyway, yes. So foot here, yeah. Okay. So here we're looking at a bivalve. You have, a, you have gills, because these are um, aquatic organisms, of course. And then, let's see, um, your adductor muscles will go through bivalve um, anatomy pretty well in lab, but the adductor muscles help with the opening and closing of the hinge, hinged shell. Okay, and you see he has a, its um, digestive system here, right? And this, the closed circulate or the open circulatory system, so they do have a heart. Okay, and here are the cephalopods. Oh yes, don't forget the cephalopods. So the cephalopods, the um, you have the mantle, and um, basically they have they have an internalized shell. Okay, all right, and very complex eyes. And here, okay, so one important thing: so the bivalves, the gastropods, and the chitons have that muscular foot. Cephalopods still technically have the foot, but it's been modified into tentacles, okay? So that's, they're still, they still have the foot. It's just been modified. All right, so this very important foot here, perhaps you've seen it. This is the underside of a gastropod um, 
ventral foot, right? So this is the main way that many of the mollusks move, all right, is using that muscular foot. Um, whereas in the cephalopods, like I just said, you have tentacles and arms. All right, so these organisms um, have a coelom, but it's really, it's just really only a small space around the heart and parts of their digestive tract and parts of the excretory organs. Let me see if uh, I was showing you, if I show you the coelom very well. No. So just know that the coelom in the mollusks is very reduced. Okay. Um, and let's see. The other big thing you need to know is um, the gills are actually called tenidia. And so that's a special name for them. And they serve multiple functions, particularly in the bivalves. They serve a um, function of filtering the food. Okay. So they're an additional like filtration. They're a filtration device, essentially, in the bivalves. Cool. And that visceral mass, so I told you, the mollusk body is head and foot and visceral mass. That visceral mass is where you find um, the organs, most of the organ systems. So reproductive system, digestive system, visceral mass. All right, let's talk about shells. So I bet you can't guess why they have a shell. Protection. Okay, grows out of the mantle. And interestingly, I look really ominous. This, um, the shell actually has been reduced or lost multiple times in the mollusk lineages, so it's not an essential um, an essential part of the animal. Okay, but it is useful because it provides that protection. And so, typically, what you have for the shell is a double la a double layer of calcium carbonate and as I said before, you know, you have that mother of pearl. So that mother of pearl is that internal layer of the shell. Excuse me, abalone shells. Um, it may be mother of pearl or it may be nacre. So what nacre is, is the nacre is literally the substance that um, these organisms deposit that creates pearls, actually. So um, the way a pearl is made, and here you see there's a little pearl. Here's some pearls. So the way, the reason that bivalves make pearls is basically whenever some sort of irritant like sand or sediment gets in between the mantle and um, the inner shell layer, it irritates the animal. It's an irritant, right? That makes sense. Um, so they they produce nacre and basically deposit nacre around the irritant multiple layers essentially to keep it from further irritating the animal and so they're like it's basically they're closing off the irritant and that is what leads to the production of pearls that is the production of pearls pearls are simply nacre deposits caused by an irritant like sand usually it is sand but it can could be you know some really small organism or what have you, that has somehow gotten in between the mantle and the inner shell layer. All right, so um, I told you you have the head, the foot, and the visceral mass. And some of these you have, um, the head and the foot are not separated like they are in um, other animals. You see the head and the foot are actually very close together. Um, so that is one of the key features of mollusks, and many of them have really complex eyes. Um, definitely light sensing organs, but many have extremely complex eyes, especially the cephalopods. Cephalopods have eyes very similar to our own. So that is one really interesting innovation in the mollusks. And they have a radula. So the radula is a hallmark of the mollusks, 
and you'll find it um, in all the mollusks except the bivalves. So you'll find it in snails, and you have um, modified, um, this has been modified into a beak in the cephalopods, but essentially it is their rasping organ that they use for feeding. So for the most part, like most gastropods are, they feed with their radula and they, they are uh, essentially, they're herbivorous. And so they will scrape algae um, and material off of whatever surface, you know, typically the bottom of wherever they're living, the benthos, which is the bottom of like a, an aquatic, an aquatic system. Um, but some of them have modified radulas, but the radula again is just that rasping organ. And I will post, I'll post the video of an organism, um, a mollusk using its radula, because it's really interesting to watch. And these are actually ele electron micrograph um, uh, photos of the radula. It's very, this is the radula. Okay, so it's very um, specialized. And some of them, like I said, have been modified. So in the cone of snails, which are a marine snail that you typically have to watch out for, you don't you do not want to step on them. Um, the the radula has become a, ven a harpoon with a venom gland for catching prey. All right, so let's talk about the excretory and circulatory systems in mollusks. Um, so in the mollusks, the wastes are removed, and I say nit it's nitrogenous wastes. So, like your urine, nitrogenous wastes, is accomplished via the nephridia, or the, the singular is the nephridium. So, the, the nephridium in an animal. And each nephridium has a little, um, it's like a funnel, a cilia lining it, and that, that funnel is called a nephrostome. And basically, what happens is Waste will accumulate in the nephridium and then be excreted. So let's look here. So you have the nephridium, and then the waste will be excreted, goes down here to the mantle cavity, okay? And then out through here, the anus. And that's really it. I mean, it's a very simple excretory system. You have the nephridium, Nephrostomes, or a nephrostome, which is the opening to the nephridium lined with cilia. All right, so let's talk about circulatory systems. As I mentioned before, these guys have an open circulatory system, and their blood, which we call hemolymph, is moved through the heart um, uh, to the hemocyl. So the hemocyl is essentially just the cilemic cavity. Okay, and Mollusks have a three-chambered heart, so that's an important thing to remember. Um, three-chambered heart. So, most mollusks, open circulatory system. There is one exception, and that is the cephalopods. So those are the octopi and the squids. They have a closed circulatory system. And when you think about mollusks, you know, I keep saying, well, there's an exception to this one thing, and this group doesn't have this. Um, cephalopods are typically that exception. So, you know, you think of the ventral foot, cephalopods have that, but it is modified in arms and tentacles. You have the radula and cephalopods, it's mat modified into a, um, a beak, all right? Cephalopods have a closed circulatory system. All right, so let's talk about reproduction. Baby mollusks. So most mollusks are, so here's a new word, gonochoric. So gonochoric is a synonym of dioecious. Dioecious is, remember we refer to, you can refer to plants and invertebrate animals as dioecious. That means you have male, biologically male and biologically female animals. Um, gonochoric is the same kind of thing. You have males and females. However, there are some mollusks who are hermaphroditic. Most are gonochoric. There are hermaphroditic ones, um, and they, that, some of the gastropods are hermaphrodites and some bivalves, but for the most part, you have male and female animals, and some, but some of them, particularly in the bivalves, can actually 
change sex. And you see this in, in several animals, um, even in some vertebrates, you see um, the animal changing sex depending on conditions. So pretty interesting. All right, so most of the time you will have external fertilization where the gametes, um, because most of these animals live in the water, right? So you have the release of gametes into the water and fertilization will happen in the water. And then you have the development of the trochophore larva, who's free swimming, right? Um, however, gastropods internal or have internal fertilization, and actually what happens is the male will deposit um, the male will deposit the sperm into the female, but there's not any sort of preformed chamber. They just stick it in her body cavity, not like into her body, right? There's no there's no vagina or anything like that or cloaca. So, um, oh, and this is and this is one of the reasons. These, so remember, these guys are in the big group Spiralia. So the mollusk, once it's a zygote, um, once you have a fertilized egg, these undergo spiral cleavage. Yeah, that makes sense, right? These are protostomes, and particularly in group Spiralia, so it can help you remember that. So, so once that zygote is developed, again, the free-swimming trochophore larva is that first larval stage. And in some of the mosques, you actually have a second larval stage, and that is the veliger larva. And the veliger larva is also free-swimming, um, but you also see the beginnings of the shell and the muscular foot. And the veliger larva is really only present in marine snails and bivalves. So just know that. Like cephalopods don't have a veliger larva. And chitons don't either. All right. So there are seven or eight recognized classes of mollusks. You may have, you may know by now that we're still trying to resolve some animal phylogeny. So each of these, you have polyplacophora. Those are the chitons. We're going to go through each one of these, and we'll see how many we get through, the, through today. I'm actually, um, we're actually, we may get through a little bit more than I thought. So chitons, gastropods. Those are the snails and slugs and limpets, which many people will see a limpet and they mistake it for. A bivalve, but they're not bivalves. They're not. Um, they are gastropods. And you have the bivalves, which are the clams, the oysters, the scallops, everything my husband loves to eat. Um, cephalopods, so that is the chambered nautilus, octopi, cuttlefishes, and the scaphopods. And the scaphopods are the, oh man, these guys are super cool. Do I have a picture of them for you? Yeah. So these guys are the tusk shells, and they're very interesting mollusks. Um, their name actually means shovel foot. Anyway, we're going to talk about each one of these in turn. We're going to start with the chitons. So the chitons are little marine, not little, they're not little, what am I saying? They're marine animals, and they have oval bodies. They remind me of, they look like they have little plates, um, because they have these, well, they have, calcareous plates. And so the body is comprised of these overlapping plates, but the body underneath is not segmented like that. Okay. And these organisms, just like many of the other mollusks, have a radula. Um, and they are typically herbivores. So they will use that radula to scrape algae off of the bottom of the water body or the in the set of, well, wherever it's at. Um, or off of rocks, particularly rocks. If you're in the ocean and it's full of sand, you scrape an algae off the rocks. Okay. And they live in shallow areas, but they're more, and I says shallow hard bottoms, they're more prevalent where there are shallow hard bottoms because that's where there are more food resources, right? So that's important to remember there because it's where their food, their algae will grow because you need that hard surface. So here are two other chitons. And you see, so you have eight dorsal plates, calcareous plates, so they're hard, calcium carbonate. And on the underside, um, the animal is actually, let's see, well, the, under, the animal is actually a little soft thing on the underside. I don't think I have a picture to show you the underside of a chitin, but I encourage you to look it up. 
um, because I think they're pretty cute. And that's it. Those are the chitons. So they're marine, and they have those plates, and they're herbivores. Okay. One thing that might be helpful is when you're studying, especially now, this we're all, we're doing things that are a little bit more closer to what we've been doing in lab. So you may create, you may want to create some sort of table. Where like, okay, here are the mollusks, or maybe make yourself a little cute poster for your bedroom during quarantine, and you're like. Oh, right. You know, last time we talked about the flatworms, here are the flatworms, and here are what we know about them, and decorate your room, and the diversity of life. I will give you bonus points. Oh, sorry, B. I'll give you bonus points. Make a poster. Don't go to the store to get the po Make it out of stuff that's at your house. And make, for each phylum, I'll give you that's a lot. You know what? Yeah, it's work. If you make a poster, and I mean like a poster, not a page, a poster out of, and like, out and, and it's for each phylum, for each phylum you do, I'll give you two points. Yeah. Decorate your room. There you go. <clears throat> not like you don't have enough to do in quarantine. You don't have to, this, but if you want to, yeah. So, all right, let's come back. So let's talk about the scaphopods. These are the tusk shells. And many people, this is like the first time they've heard of them. And again, their name actually means shovelfoot. So unlike other mollusks, their shells open at two ends. The other, the other mollusks, you may, you know, they have shells open in one place, two places. And they have a tubular shell and the inside is where their body is. Okay. And they have a conical, they have a foot and the, um, just like other mollusks, they have a mouth with a radula and tentacles. The tentacles, though, are called, um, kept I always get this wrong, Kepta keptacula. There you go. And each one is a keptaculum. And those are basically the names of, those are tentacles. Um, they don't have a real, a true head, but they do have, actually, I've put in, um, so you can see the inside of, the tube shell. Um, so you have most of the reproductive system up here. I am not going to ask you about tube shell anatomy. This is just for just for you. So reproduction, right? Okay, you have digestive system, and obviously digestive system comes up here. But you have um, captacula, so the tentacles coming in, right? And the they don't have a true head, but they have like a mouth, and they have ganglia. And that's all around here. So basically what will happen is food comes in here and is, is eaten and digested. All right. And they, um, their mantle is important. And this is their important mantle is important in respiration because they're buried. So um, they actually bury into the uh, burrow into the sand. That's actually why they're called shovel foot or shovel foot because they use their bodies to, um, their foot to burrow into the sand. All right. That's all you got to know about scaphopods. Gastropods, which means stomach foot. They're so cute. So these are the snails, the slugs, and the limpets. All right. So these are limpets. This is a limpet. Okay. Um, let's see. Snail. Snail, nudibranch. These guys are really cool. We'll talk more about them in just a sec. Snail. I'm really sad you're not going to get to hang out with all the snails, snail shells in the lab, but that's okay. All right, so with the snails, most snails are marine, but there are freshwater snails. Um, if you've ever been out in the field with me, you've seen me try to not step on snails because it's horrifying. They're really small. And these, and also snails can be in your garden. These mollusks are the only mollusks you'll ever find in your garden. If you find an octopus in your garden, then it's an octopus's garden. <laughs> but calm it. <laughs> okay. So, these are the only terrestrial mollusks. Those are the snails and the slugs, right? Um, now, some have snail, snail shells. Snail shells. But some do not have shells, right? Nudibranchs don't have shells. Slugs don't have snail. 
Bill. So, again, shells have been lost multiple times. They are protective, but they're not vital for the animal. Although I'm sure many a slug that has had salt put on it has been like, no, I wish I had a snail. A shell, not a snail. Uh, maybe it wishes it had a snail too. So um, you may have seen on the snails, they have tentacles, a pair of tentacles with eyes, right? And oh, one cool thing about these guys. So gastropods undergo torsion. This, it sounds horrifying. Um, it's a really interesting process. It's where, um, as the snail develops from a larva to an adult, the, yes, see, the, the mantle and the anus will move from the end of the, the posterior end of the animal to the anterior end of the animal. So it's like, um, it twists. That's why it's called torsion. And, again, this is unique among animals. And basically, um, if you look at a gastropod, if you were to very carefully um, look at the anatomy, many ga most gastropods are not perfectly bilaterally symmetrical as adults because of torsion. So, torsion is the process by which, and mainly just remember, like, the anus um, is moved from the posterior end of the animal to the front. Well, that in the mantle cavity, where the shell will come from. All right. Nudibranchs. So these are the are sea slugs. Adorable. So those are the ones that I posted about penis fencing. And these are predators. They have, um, many of them secrete really distasteful can of chemicals um, to deter predators and also to catch prey. And here you see a wide variety. They're incredibly diverse phenotypically. Very diverse. It looks like, I mean, like, if you were to just go to, like, a Nudibranch museum, it's like going to invertebrate electric forest. I hope I don't know what that is. Okay, so, it's a music festival. All right, so, nudibranchs don't have a shell, as I said, but they do have branches here. This is actually either gills or gut. Some of, for many of them, it's um, branches of their gut, and, um, well, some of them are gut and some of them are gills, and they are predatory. Um, they eat other invertebrates, okay? One really cool thing that they can do is... To um, when they ingest prey, if they ingest like a jellyfish, they can actually utilize and keep the nematocysts from um, from the prey that they eat, the cnidarian prey they eat, so they can use it too. All right. So. The bivalves, bivalvia, so this is a class, so kingdom, phylum, mollusca, class, so we did um, polyplacophora is a class, scaphopoda is a class, gastropoda is a class, bivalvia is a class. Oh no, battery stretch. So, it's a class. And... Most bivalves are marine, but of course you've heard of freshwater mussels. They're beautiful. And these are marine. What you're seeing here. Beautiful. This includes the scallops. So these bivalves are filter feeders. Um, and they, here you see the, the muscular foot sticking out. Okay. And Mol bivalves are the only mollusks that don't have some sort of radula or a modified radula. There's no radula. They are filter feeders. Okay, so that's one thing to remember is the mode of feeding for these for different organisms in the mollusca. And so bivalves filter, and they don't have a distinct head. They don't have a distinct cephalization like you see in the gastropods and the cephalopods and other mollusks. Palaclacophorans and stuff like that. 
So that's an important distinction in the bivalves. And they have that hinged shell. And the adductor muscles are um, basically assist with the, the opening and closing of that. They have they also have an, um, an intake, they, they have an intake siphon, they have an excretory siphon. So they have siphons that allow them to take in water and also excrete it. So let me show you. Um, and we're going to go through this in your lab too, but it's really amazing how um, how complex these actually are. I think I'm only showing you one little bit though with the gills. Yeah, we're not showing you all the beautiful visceral mass. So that's okay. Um, for some reason, I was thinking I was going to show you the visceral mass. But so here you have the adductor muscles, right? Gills. And I don't typically make my students know the foot muscles, the retractor muscles, but I'm just going to point them out to you here and here. Here is the muscular foot. So you see it's actually connected all the way back here. And then here is the mantle. So the mantle is if you open up a bivalve that's alive, you'll see like a fleshy thing, a fleshy, fleshy tissue and that clearly the shell is growing out of. That is the mantle. Okay. So those are the parts that I really want you to know. I don't, you don't really necessarily, these are the labial, labial palps. Um, you don't have to know about, um, you don't have to know where they are, but the labial palps, and I think that's all of it. Yes. All right. So the way that muscles stay on stuff, if you're ever wondering, like, how do they stick to stuff? They have, um, they secrete these threads called bristle threads, and that's actually how they hang on to stuff. So they're not magic. These are zebra muscles. Um, this is showing you a zebra muscle, actually. So here you can see the bristle threads, and that's actually how they attach to things like and all other mollusks, like boats and things like that. And, um, hurry. Here you see um, an oyster. Whoa, their left shell. Um, cemented to a hard surface, and the other to another oyster, there and there. All right, cephalopods. I'm running out of time. We have time to talk about cephalopods? Mm, nah. So I think we're going to stop here. I feel like that's long enough. Um, I went a little farther than I was planning to today, but here's why I'm doing that. Here's my plan. I'm still going to record nearly 50 minute lectures um, whenever possible and we may finish early and if we finish with the lectures early that's great um, and that gives you more time for questions but you know it's a little easier for me to to move through the the material you know because you're able to stop you can stop your videos and watch them at your leisure now so um, so let's just give you some of my thought process in that. So we're going to pick up on, you don't have to watch a video on Friday, but I am going to post one on Friday. It'll be for Monday, but you can't, well, I'll post it before Friday, but you can watch. You don't have to on Friday because we can't expect you to be doing things. It's good Friday. Um, so with that, I hope to see you. We are still going to have, since it's optional, um, we are going to have our Q&A Friday morning at 8 but it is optional and I'll put the link up in Google Meet. Um, and I think that's all for today. So um, I need to come up with some sort of tagline now that I'm like on the interwebs doing this, right? Uh, stay curious. It doesn't like, is that a sprizzle? I don't want to, I don't want to, no, we're not plagiarizing. We're not stealing. Uh, be, no, that's, I'll come up with something. So, go outside, though. Find a mollusk. Find a mollusk! Yeah. Okay. That's my tagline for today. Find a mollusk. All right. Take care.